Well, everyone loves a good story. A couple weeks ago, Elizabeth and I had the fun of introducing our two little boys to The Wizard of Oz. We wondered whether a movie made so long ago would be able to hold their attention in an age of short attention spans and iPads and soundbite television and all that kind of stuff. But as we got out the movie snacks and the blankets and curled up and fired up the screen, we only found out that they were enthralled by the story. They couldn't get enough of it, just like the millions of viewers before them. Released in 1939, The Wizard of Oz, according to the U.S. Library of Congress, is the most seen film in history. It's widely regarded as one of the greatest in the history of cinema. But its success is not simply because of the wonderful, memorable songs like Over the Rainbow. It's not just because of the giant stardom of Judy Garland cast as Dorothy. It's not even because of the technological marvel of the color process that was used in that filmmaking, making it the most expensive production to date for MGM Studios at the time. The Wizard of Oz is a good story. In fact, the 1900 novel on which it was based by Frank Baum was so popular that it produced 13 sequels multiple stage adaptations, and five other feature movies before The Wizard of Oz was made that we know so well. It's a good story. Contains timeless themes like the battle between good and evil, the value of friendship, and of course that well-known truism, there's no place like, there's no place like home. Today we're taking our inspiration from the book of Jonah, and Pastor Derek will return to that series next week. We're taking a little bit of a sidetrack inspired by the book into the New Testament. Because Jonah is a very unique story in that it contains many major biblical themes in one short tale. Important themes like disobedience, mercy, sovereignty, and mission. Those are themes of the great story, the story of the gospel. So I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to a passage that also does a great job encapsulating that story in a very short space. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 carries the essence of the gospel in 10 short verses. So I want to read for you beginning at verse number one. Ephesians chapter two, beginning at verse one. This is God's word. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This letter is written by Paul to a primarily Gentile audience, the church in Ephesus, a place where he had spent three years on his second missionary journey. It's written from prison as Paul is behind bars in Rome. 
But unlike some of the other prison epistles, it's not addressing any particular heresy, any particular challenge, or any particular acute need in that church. In some ways, it's a discourse on the perspective of faith certainly written as though it's intended for a much broader audience than just a few individuals or even one particular local church, and certainly takes the focus on the big picture of faith. It points, ultimately, in various ways to the overarching glory of God. That's one reason why it's so easy to see the major biblical themes woven throughout, just as we see in the book of Jonah. So let's take a look at four of these great themes of the great story. Firstly, it's a story about God's holiness. It's a story of God's holiness. If we turn our attention to the first four verses of Ephesians 2, you can see Paul is describing mankind's departure from the standard of God's perfection, his holiness. He's describing man's rebellion against God's holiness. He's describing the believer's former pre-salvation state, and it's filled with imagery of the fall, isn't it? Following the prince of the power of the air is a reference, of course, to the great tempter himself, the devil. The sons of disobedience are all those who follow the original disobedient one, Satan, who opposed the authority of God, who wanted to make God a god of himself, and who was ultimately cast out of heaven. Then he took up aim against the crown of God's creation. Man and woman appeared as a serpent in Genesis chapter 1. Seduced Eve who brought Adam along for the horrible ride and sin entered the world. There's a bunch of things we could say about sin as it's described in this part of the story. But let me just point out three really quick things for you. The first is that sin leads to death. Sometimes I think... We've heard this fact so often that we lose sight of the harshness of this reality. Sometimes I I think we we see so much death dramatized and glamorized in the media and in in video games where you can just shoot people up indiscriminately. We lose sight of the cold, harsh reality of what death is. Paul hasn't lost sight of it. He says it simply and says it clearly. Before Christ, you were dead in your sin. Without life, without breath, spiritual separation from God is death in that sense, but also leads to the physical manifestation in the death of the tissue of our our bodies. These vessels are dying. The body cannot sustain itself indefinitely, try as people might. Eventually, it will expire. Apart from the explicit work of God, it will remain expired. Not only that, but apart from the sustaining hand of God, we have no life at all in our bodies. But the unstoppable march of our bodies toward the grave is a very present reminder that because of the fall, everything is in a state of decay. Genesis 3.17 and Romans 8.21 agree that all of creation is in a state of decay because of the fall of man into sin. So the scriptures attest that sin leads to death. James 1 verse 5 says, when, when, when it is accomplished, sin brings forth death. Romans 6.23 says, you know the wages of sin is it's death. The problem is that sin is pervasive. That's number two. Not only does sin lead to death, but sin is pervasive. It's the nature of all men and women after the fall. Paul actually emphasizes the universality of sin in this part of the story. He does it by creating a we and they comparison. Remember Paul's writing to the Gentiles, right? The the Ephesian believers were, were, for the most part, Gentiles. And so he's writing this letter to Gentile believers. Sometimes his argument that he intends to to highlight is the difference between the Gentiles and the Jews, showing the inclusiveness of God's plan of salvation also available now to them. But here, he's showing the comprehensiveness of sin. Watch. In verse 1, he says, you were dead. He's talking, he means you Gentiles. 
in your trespasses and sin. That's the way you were before the sacrifice of Christ. But in verse 3, he says, we all once lived this way. So it includes the Jews too. We all once lived like this. Jews and Gentiles alike. Then at the end of verse 3, the exclamation point is where he lumps both groups in with all of mankind who are by nature children of wrath. That expression, children of wrath, means essentially those who deserve the punishment of death. So again, you have the implication that the standard of God's holiness has been compromised. It's been compromised by all of mankind. And so the scriptures affirm there's no one who is righteous, not even one, Psalm 14, and elsewhere. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know Romans 3, 23. So the third thing you notice about sin is that the state of fallenness is a self-centered, self-indulgent state. See how Paul describes the state of rebellion against God in verse 3? Living in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind. It's all about me, what I want. And it's not just the physical body that's the problem. That was part of the, the error of Gnosticism was it, under the influence of Greek philosophy, feeling like the, the, all matter was evil and all spirit was essentially good and it's the job of the spirit to escape the prison of the mind. No, that's not at all what, what the way that God created existence. Paul emphasizes that here. Paul is teaching that mind and body together are opposed to God in the fallen state. In fact, if you study the word flesh as it is used by Paul, we don't have time to do that this morning, but you will discover that essentially what he means is the whole self oriented away from God. Sin is an attack on the purity of God. It's a rebellion against the holiness of God. It's a corruption of the standard of perfection set by God in his very nature. And it enters the story through every man and woman who have walked on the earth after Adam and Eve. See, sin is your biggest problem. Now, I know you've got problems. I've got problems. We all have problems, some big ones, some heavy burdens, some big challenges, some huge obstacles, some things to overcome that are tough. But the Bible teaches that sin is your biggest problem, it's my biggest problem because it corrupts the story of God's holiness and separates us from him. The bad news is, because of the fall, where sin was injected into the story, because of the fall, we are slaves to sin. And apart from the work of God, we're not able not to sin. So we have a situation in which we're wholly responsible for our sin, our shortfalls, our disobedience. The wages of sin is death. But we're not able to not sin. We can't help but to do it. There's no one righteous. Now, what kind of hope could we possibly have in such a desperate situation? Well, only the mercy of God. Only the mercy of God because this is also a story of the compassion of God. It's a story of the compassion of God. You see how Paul turns a corner in verse 4 with the but God? Derek pointed this out to us in the story of Jonah. Jonah went away from the Lord, but God. Paul does the same thing in verse 4. But God. All is lost. Sin and death have separated man from the Holy One. But God has a way. Why? Because he's rich in mercy, verse 4. Notice with me really quickly, God's love is great. As much as we can minimize the severity of sin and the reality of death, sometimes I think we can miss the profoundness of God's love. You think that would be hard to do in a culture that's so focused on that one attribute of God, often to the exclusion of his other qualities. But the love of contemporary culture wants to ascribe to God is a Hollywood love. It's an overly emotional pop culture. I'm okay, you're okay, all you need is love 
kind of love. That's not what Paul is talking about. It's not the love described by Paul. God's love is rich in mercy, he says. Love so great, it reaches across a chasm of sin even when we were running in the other direction. In outright rebellion against him, love so powerful, it could reach us in our state of being dead and revive us and bring us back to God. God's love is so great and his favor is so undeserved. Verse 5 has one of those cool parenthetical exclamations that you see in Paul sometimes where he's talking about something and then he just has to pause and insert that word, that phrase, by grace you've been saved. He, he makes the point at length in verse 8 where he talks about grace and grace through faith, but here he's talking in the middle of a sentence and he blurts it out preemptively in verse 5, by grace you've been saved. We don't deserve God's gift of salvation at all. We are children of wrath who deserve death. But God's story is a story of how he made a way to satisfy the demands of his holiness while maintaining his overflowing nature of love. And that way, of course, is through his son, Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross gives us what we don't deserve. It gives us life. God's love is great, his favor undeserved, and his grace gives us life. See that in verse 5 and 6. He made us alive. He made us alive. We were dead, but now we're alive. He's raised us up. Paul alludes to the resurrection of Jesus himself, which was the victorious confirmation of what he accomplished on the cross. Then he treats it as a foregone conclusion, the truth that we are seated in heaven with Christ, participants in the abundant life that he came to give. Wow. Wow. There could be no greater love story in all of history, in all the stories that were ever written. How could we ever minimize the awesomeness of the love of God. How could we ever misrepresent it by making it sappy or permissive or all about tolerance of sin rather than the outright destruction of sin, which is what he's done? Sometimes you need to skip the cool contemporary songs and just go to a hymn. So please bear with me and listen to the words penned by Frederick Lehman in 1917. You might not know this hymn, but you should. The love of God is greater far than the tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Men and women and angels, millions upon millions, singing in a heavenly choir forever, will never be able to fully describe the love of God. That is the love he has for you. We're just sinners. We don't deserve a lick of it, but God is rich in mercy. And in his great love and compassion, he has brought us into his story. And those who receive him will be singing those words for eternity. It's a story of God's holiness, 
It's a story of God's compassion. Thirdly, it's a story of God's grand plan. This is the theme of sovereignty. In verse 7, Paul shows us that God had in mind all the while the reason for showing this great compassion to those disobedient to his holy law. The so that in verse 7 tells us why. It shows us that God is sovereign over all his creation and he's working out a plan that he had in mind from the beginning. What can we learn about this plan? Number one, God's plan is comprehensive. It extends back before the fall of man, referenced in the beginning of the story, in the first four verses, all the way through the coming ages, here in verse 7, to the distant future. The use of the time imagery by Paul calls to mind the scope and scale of God's grand plan. He's sovereign over all of history. So God's plan is comprehensive. Number two, God's plan is for his glory. You might be surprised to know that though God's love for you is so vast and great, which it is, the primary reason for God creating us at all was not you or me per se. It was for his own glory. Now that might seem selfish to you, If you view God from a human perspective, the selfish God, the God out for his own glory. Because when we when we seek our own glory, it's always tainted by our sin, and it's always unjust because we don't deserve glory. But God deserves all the glory. The psalmist writes, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Psalm 29. What is his due? Everything. It's a function of his holiness that all glory is due to him. It's a function of his mercy and compassion that all praise is due to him. So Paul teaches over in Colossians chapter 1, speaking about Christ. For him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and, get this, for him. But the wonderful, even mysterious truth is that God's story can accomplish so many things at the same time as glorifying the sovereign Lord. So that he did all this for us in his great love, verse 7, so that he might show, verse 8, the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. Glory to God that through the story he shows himself worthy of all adoration. And we are the happy beneficiaries of God's plan of self-glorification. We are the us at the end of verse 7. His grace and kindness toward us. Which actually leads us to the fourth element of the story, and that is, it's a story of God's purpose for us. Romans 8.28 is another great verse on the sovereignty of God who in all things works for the good of those who love him, but we sometimes forget the last part. Who are called according to his, his purpose. God has given us a purpose. He's given us a mission. This is the theme of mission. What is that purpose? Look at verse 8 and all the way to 10. God has called us to faith. That's how we receive his grace. It's not anything that we earn. It's not a work. Our faith is simply a step in return to the step that he has taken, the big step that he has taken toward us. Because God's desire is for us and all mankind that all would come to faith in him. That's why 1 Peter 3 verse 9 says, he's not willing that any should perish under the wrath of his holy judgment but that we repent from our disobedience and accept his merciful gift that he planned from the very beginning. So our call is to faith. Our call is to worship. That idea is part of what it means to be his workmanship. We are God's special creation. His very image created in his, 
image, created to be worshipers of the creator. We're called to worship. And finally, we're called to good works. We're getting short on time, so I won't talk too much about it, but this is our call to mission. We're called to be salt and light for him in the world, to live the gospel and share the gospel so that many out there will come to know him. What a story. Story of God's holiness. Man's assault on the holiness of God through disobedience and sin. It's a story of God's compassion. A God who's rich in mercy and unfathomable love. You just sang it a couple minutes ago. Amazing love. How can it be? It reminds me every time we sing that song of our dear friend who passed on to glory a couple years ago, Richard Caesar, who used to play the drums for us. It's his favorite song. And I don't know if we ever did that song. That we would be going along and all of a sudden the drums would stop and I would look over and he would have stopped drumming because he couldn't contain the thanksgiving and praise of God who loved him so much to take him out of the darkness of sin into his marvelous light. It's the story of God's mercy. The story of God's grand plan. The Lord who orchestrated that plan from the very beginning, the plan of redemption, before time began so that he could be glorified in redeeming us. And a story of God's purpose for we, the redeemed. Privileged to be on mission with him for the expansion of his kingdom. The big question for us that we're all left with is, where are you in the story? Where are you in the story? Are you still in act one? Are you far off and away in sin, in disobedience, in rebellion? Are you dead? Are you frustrated because you can't find a purpose in life? Maybe you need the mercy of God. Maybe you need the grace of God. Maybe you need to realize you're not the main character in the story. <coughs> He's the main character. But if it means freedom from sin, if it means forgiveness from trespasses, if it means reprieve from disobedience, life abundant and everlasting after being lost in sin and death, life with a purpose and part of an eternal plan, wouldn't you be willing to play a scarecrow or a tin man or a flying monkey or even Toto? Wouldn't you want to take that place as part of the grand story of the God of the universe and Jesus Christ, his son? If you haven't done that, today can be the day. You admit your need for him. You admit your rebellion and disobedience and ask God to come and be Lord of your life. He's a merciful Savior who loves you with a grand love. And if you do know him as sovereign Lord, you can lean into him, knowing that he delights to work out his perfect plan and purpose in your life, to follow him, cling to him, keep trusting him. He's the real hero of the story and only he can fulfill the desires of your heart. Let's pray. Merciful Savior, Sovereign Lord, thank you for your great love and mercy for us for the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and for the abundant life that you invite us to with you, to be part of your story, Lord. Would you convict our hearts? Would you sear our consciences this morning? And would you make us the characters you would have us be as we live for your glory and the glory of your son, Jesus Christ? 